Hello and welcome to this journey through the music of the world. This course explores the musical diversity of human culture around the world, focusing on historical, geographical, linguistic and other cultural aspects that allow for a general understanding of the different musical traditions that have developed and the relations between them. In the next series of lessons, we will explore the music of Asia, Africa, Europe, North and South America, and we will also delve into specific cultural traditions such as the Roma Gypsy people who spread from Central Asia all the way into Europe and Celtic peoples. Through careful listening and analysis of recorded and live performed examples, we will try and understand the interconnections that link apparently unrelated traditional musical styles and thus through an understanding of the gradual changes that culture and music undergo, we will be able to trace a musical continuum around the globe. The main objective of this course is for students to be able to listen to a map of the world and understand how different musical traditions are related to one another. My name is Nano Stern. I am a musician from Santiago de Chile, deep in the south of South America and I um, spend most of my time playing folk music and I've been lucky enough to spend most of my adult life traveling around the world performing, but not only performing, also exchanging music with people from all over the place. It is one of the greatest joys of my life to be able to learn and to teach at the same time. You know? Music is this incredible uh, tool that allows us to communicate with each other and allows us to get such deep insight into the different cultures. You know? uh, when you travel and you take an instrument, say your guitar or, or, or just your voice, you open up doors, people welcome you in a different way, no matter where you go. And the energy that you sense from people and that you get to experience yourself performing music and learning from each other is the same, no matter where you go. Um, the world is such an immense place, full of culture, full of diversity, full of richness. I hope sincerely that uh, this course will help you to appreciate that beauty, uh, to learn lots of different kinds of music, um, to enjoy each specific kind of tradition, but also to understand that no matter how specific it is, it is always connected to some other culture and somehow they are all connected together. I really hope that you enjoy exploring the incredible musical diversity of humankind. Welcome to this journey through the music of the world. You might have heard or read about this concept of world music, either on festivals, on programming, on radios, on the internet. But why do we speak of music of the world and not of world music? World music is a concept taken from academy and used by the music industry, the record selling industry, since the early 1980s to promote ethnic, traditional and most music sung in languages other than English. The concept is deceiving, for it puts most of the enormous musical diversity of planet Earth under a single category. It is a one-size-fits-all concept that we should be very careful with. Think about it. Before Spotify, before even iTunes, back then in the prehistory of the music industry, when people used to buy records in record stores, you would have categories. So you would walk in and you would have pop, you would have rock, you would have pop rock, you would have prog rock, heavy metal, soft rock, easy listening, jazz, jazz fusion, fusion rock, fusion pop, soft pop, and so on, and you would have a million different categories, you know, just for Western mainstream music. And then, usually, far in the back, in one little corner of the shop, you would find this spot that said world music, where everything else, all the other music in the world would fit nicely and politely together. I personally feel that this is a very colonialist concept that we should be careful with. So, when I speak of the music of the world, what am I referring to? 
I'm referring to non-globalized traditional music of ethnic origin, which is mostly transmitted orally and can be considered to be either folk music or non-Western classical music, as is the case, for example, in India, where we have both folk and classical music, which usually fall under the same one-size-fits-all category of world music. Music is often said to be a universal language. Is it really? It's a very tricky question, and to approach it, we should break it up into two parts. First, is music language? And further, what is language? Languages are systems of communication which allow members of specific cultural groups to share information with each other. There's, of course, different kinds of language, verbal, non-verbal, written, visual, and so on. And then there's music. Music can communicate more or less specific information. For example, emotions. Let me just grab my guitar and see if I can make you feel a particular emotion. So, how do you feel? What does this make you feel? It makes you feel happy, it makes you feel uh, dancey, it makes you want to move and bounce around, probably sing along if I would come up with a smart lyric to go with it. And this um, comes across through cultures. No? Of course, not every culture approaches emotion in music in the same way, but we can uh, consider it a large part of the totality of humanity to be able to uh, perceive this as happy, no? On the other hand, for example. makes you sad. It makes me sad standing here on an empty stage trying to show you. So it is quite mysterious. Why does music do this? We will not get into that, but we will consider the fact that music is able to transmit, to communicate, to give some information that I want to trespass to you. Music can also be more vague. harder to say. And we can expand our harmonies and we can play around with all the elements of music and get into a zone where we would not be so sure what we mean. But also, if we go closer into our specific culture group, in this case you and I, Western culture, we can convey much more specific messages. We can transmit information that comes much closer to a single meaning. For example, and so on. So everyone knows Christmas, no? evidently. So through a music that is associated to some specific part of our culture, we can communicate much more specific meaning. Other example. or death, darkness, a funeral. No? 
So the more uh, specific a culture group is, the more within that group we can, we can uh, share specific information. How is uh, music similar to language in other ways? Music has its own syntax. That is, its own phonemes or sounds, or if you want letters, A, E, O, X, P, F. Syllables like P, P, F, F, me, mu, me, tu, you, we. Words, like the words that I am speaking, sentences, which takes these phonemes into syllables, into words, and puts them together into meaning, and so on, and we can go on and on into larger groups of sound information. Let me illustrate. So, for example, that's one phoneme, no? Two phonemes together are sort of a musical syllable. One syllable. Another syllable. Third one. So what do we have? Sort of musical words appearing. Which convey musical meaning and which relate to each other. Of course, I'm playing around with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the famous melody. One word. Another one. Third one. And they all mean something when they are related to each other. No? The meaning comes just as in spoken language, not just one sound next to the other, but the relationship between all of these sounds. This is what I mean by musical syntax. So then we have one sentence. And what do we have next? Another sentence that complements this first one. As if I were saying, what do we have next? Next, we have another sentence. So we could say two sentences put together that complement each other and make one logical unit is the equivalent of a paragraph. Full stop. And then contrast, another sentence itself made up by words and phonemes. So there you have it, building up from the smallest blocks of sound called phonemes, the equivalent to letters, you know, these particular sounds in language, and going all the way to sentences and paragraphs, we can build a musical syntax that makes sense and that allows us to communicate some sort of meaning. So another way to approach the question of whether music is a language or not is observing the way our brains react to music. In non-musicians, that is people who have not been trained to play an instrument or are not active in listening to it with strong attention, listening to music activates parts of the brain related to the perception of sound, which is the same areas of brain that activate in babies who do not yet know how to speak or understand language. But interestingly enough, in the case of musicians, people who have been trained to either play or appreciate music deeply, listening to music activates different parts of the brain, including Wernicke's area, which is related to language comprehension. It is the same part of your brain that activates and lights up when you are listening not only to sound, but to language, to language that you are able to decipher and understand. And then 
one step further. Musicians who improvise, that is, musicians who are able to just grab their instrument and create something on the moment, not necessarily uh, reading, you know, uh, music which is already written down, uh, and this includes jazz musicians, uh, folk musicians, also classical musicians, when you think about it back in the day when the great composers were writing their, their works, they were usually improvising first no, to find those places. So all of those people, um, something different happens in their brain. There is this specific area of the brain called Broca's area, which is associated to the production of speech, that is, to speaking. So when these people, musicians, who are able to improvise are uh, stimulated with music and start improvising with the music, they are literally speaking through music. They are using that specific part of the brain associated to the production of language to make music on the go. So can you imagine one explosion of activity happens to our brain when you are improvising? At the same time, you are perceiving sound, you are deciphering it as language, and you are speaking all of that through the one activity of making music. I really wish I could get into our brains and see this for myself. So having said all of this, we can say that indeed music is intimately related to language even at a neurological level. This I find fascinating. Of course, this is not a, a psychology or psychiatry or, uh, or neurological course. I will not get deeper into that, but I invite you. There's a lot of information there if you want to explore that further. Music conveys meaning. It has its own syntax, and playing it involves parts of the brain associated with language production. So there is a clear and strong link between music and language. It is almost as if music were a sort of parallel language. So now that we have established that music is a sort of language and that it is intimately related to verbal language in many ways, we should approach the second half of our initial question. Given that music is a language, is it universal? All human cultures have been found to have some form of music, and most of them share similar kinds of music, such as song and storytelling through word and music, dance and celebration music, which is usually upbeat and gets your body moving, lullabies, which are a fundamental part of our musical education and have also a specific practical role within the culture, and religious or shamanic or healing music that has a spiritual purpose. Um, experiments have been conducted that show that there is an innate human ability to correctly identify these different kinds of music regardless of your specific culture. And that is the part to pay attention to, regardless of where you come from, regardless of if you've ever been exposed to that particular kind of music of that given culture. We are able somehow to recognize if this is dance music, if this is a lullaby, if this is healing, or if this is a song that is telling a story. This hints towards that direction that this language is actually universal in the sense that we are all able to recognize and receive much of that information, even if we are not uh, familiar with the specific culture context where this music comes from. Let's have a listen to a couple of examples from different corners of the world. We're going to listen to field recordings from Argentina here in South America, Czech Republic, Japan and Greece. So really four completely different cultures. I'm not going to tell you which kind of music we're going to listen because I want you to listen carefully and see if you can find out for yourself. Have a listen and most importantly, Enjoy the music. Aroro mi niño, aroro mi sol, aroro pedazo de mi corazón. Duérmete mi niño, ¿qué tengo que hacer? Lavar los pañales, planchar y coser. Este niño lindo se quiere dormir. Oh. 
kind of music have we just heard? Does it sound like dance music? Do you imagine people dancing? Do you imagine people crying? Do you imagine sick people being healed? Do you hear long stories being told? Or maybe it is the soft song of a mother uh, caressing its baby and putting it to sleep. Indeed, you surely got it right, I hope. If you didn't, there's many, many, many more chances. Lullabies. Different kinds of lullabies in different scales, in different cultural contexts, but lullabies in the end, which all have common characteristics which are universal. Lullabies from Argentina, from Czech Republic, from Japan, and from Greece. The fact that we are able to recognize all these different kinds of music, even without previous cultural familiarity, indicates that indeed there is a universal quality to music. I invite you to think about this further as we move along the course. Having understood this and answered our questions, we can now agree that as far as it concerns us for the purpose of this course, music is a universal language. Before we embark on our journey, let's explore some of the basic elements of music so that when I refer to them later in the course, you know what I mean. The basic elements of music are rhythm, melody, harmony, timbre, articulation, and others which we will not cover just now, but which will come our way through the course. Rhythm is the organization of events in time. A specific rhythm is a given succession of events or sound or silence in time. There is rhythm all around us. Think of the day and the night, the seasons, the planet going around the sun, or even inside our own bodies, in our heart, which beats in time. Our human brains have the need to make sense out of rhythm. Take, for example, the ticking of a clock. What does that sound like to you? We're all bound to describe that sound as tick tock, tick tock, pretty much like the social media platform. But in reality, the clock doesn't go tick tock, tick tock. It produces equal sounding beats, which would be better described more like an infinite tick, 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 without any difference between one and the other. We give predominance to every other tick in order to turn that ungraspable set of sounds into something comprehensible, something that we can grasp, into a cycle that repeats itself. So everything has rhythm. Ta 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 ta. Every phrase that I say, ta 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 ta. Every step you take, every smile you give, every breath you make. Everything has rhythm. You know. Rhythm is present in everything, and it's a very beautiful and obsessive uh, thing to do, to listen for rhythm every day. When a car goes by, when the dogs are barking, uh, when it's raining, 
when you are in class, uh, when your phone rings, everything is rhythmical and interacts with each other. So when we organize rhythm into cycles of strong and weak beats, the result is meter. The organization of rhythm into cycles of strong and weak. There is many different kinds of meter in music and the main kinds found around the world are the following. Pay attention because this is super important for the rest of the course and we're going to be going back to meter many times because it is one of the most fundamental aspects. It is kind of the DNA of many of the different ethnic musics around the world. First and simplest of all is duple meters, which is basically strong and soft, strong and weak. Two, that's why it's called duple. So one, two, one, two, one, two, or multiples of two, such as four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, pa -ra -tum -tum -tum. So I'm going to take the simplest of all meters, duple meter, uh, to be a bit repetitive because it's important that you grasp this concept. There is one strong beat, strong, weak, 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 strong, weak, 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 or in the case of the simplest duple meter just in two, is the example of the clock. Strong, weak, strong, weak. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Many kinds of music all around the world are built around duple meters. So let's have a little listen to some uh, traditional French music, the Can Can dance. So that's music built around cycles of two. Then we have triple meters, which, as the word obviously implies, are built around cycles of three. So strong, weak, and weak. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Ta -ra -pa -pa -ra -ta -ra -tan -tan -tan. pa ra 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 da ra very important to note that meter is independent from rhythm, so much so that you can have, for example, a triple meter and you can have silence on the strong beat, but it remains triple meter. For example, pam pararam, tariraram, pam pararam, pam pam, tiraram. Let's have a little bit of a listen to some mariachi from Mexico playing Sobre las Olas, a beautiful waltz in triple meter. Next, we have compound meters, uh, which are a little bit trickier. Take a duple meter, one, two, one, two. Now, what happens if that half of the cycle you divide, but not into two parts, but into three parts? That is what you call a compound meter, a meter which has one cycle of two and has subdivisions 
of three, for example. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 Or nine, for example. One, two, three, two, two, three, 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 three. One, two, three, two, two, three, 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 three. Tan da ga dam tam pa dam tam pa da da ga dan ta dan tan tan ta ga dan tan ta ram. And now, when you have compound meters, something very interesting happens. I'm gonna get a little bit mathematical now, but it's very interesting. Don't get scared. It's super simple, basic division. Uh, when you have six, you can divide this 6, 8, for example, in two different ways. You can divide it into two big groups of three. One, two, three, two, two, three. One, two, three, two, two, three. Or you can divide it into three smaller groups of two bits each. One, two, 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 three, two. One, two, 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 three, two. Okay, so six you can divide into two blocks of three or into three blocks of two. Super simple, straightforward maths. Two plus two plus two is six. Three plus three is six. So you can fill this same period of time in two different ways. But, and this is the really cool part, uh, you can also fill both rhythms at the same time. This is what we call polyrhythm. So you have one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, 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 three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, and check out at the same time. Okay, so one, this is the one. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Taka, ta, taka, ta, taka, 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 bam. This is ever present in most of African music. And through the influence of African music in North and South America, it is also a very common element found in all Afro musics in America, both North, Center, and South. We're going to listen now uh, to music from Argentina. This is El Cholito from the North of Argentina, I hope that you enjoy this feeling of compound meter on the one side and polyrhythm on the other. Keep your ears wide open. And finally, I'm going to tell you about irregular or asymmetrical meters. So far, we have explored meters which repeat uh, symmetrical and regular patterns. For example, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, one, two, three, or in the case of the a bit more complex polyrhythm, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, wow. But it's always the same cycle of the same cycle of the same length, sorry, which repeats itself. But in the case of irregular or asymmetrical meters, you have different parts of different lengths put together, which are uh, not pair numbers, which you cannot divide by two. Numbers such as five, seven, nine, 11, 13, and so on. And how does this sound? Because it all uh, rings a little bit complicated maybe when I explain it, but it sounds very simple. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Ra-ta-ga-ta-tan-tan-tan-pa-ta-ran-tan-tan-tan-tan-tan-tan-ta. So in that case, we have a meter of five, eight, divided into two asymmetrical parts of three and two. 
one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, which all in all add up to five. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one. It might sound strange, but lots of music from many, many different regions of the world are built around asymmetrical meters. You can also have seven, so one, two, three, one, two, three, four, 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 or nine, where you can have, for example, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one. Let's not get into such complicated ground yet. We will later, I can assure you that. But for now, let's have a listen to a beautiful seven, eight uh, meter from Serbia. This is the band Belo Pladno, and they're gonna play for us Gugutka Guka. Enjoy and keep your ears open. How about that Serbian irregular feel? Were you able to dance? Did you feel like dancing? Believe it or not, people around the world dance to irregular meters, which is very fun to learn when you are inexperienced, like I was when I first encountered these kinds of music. So just to clarify now that we've explored different kinds of meters around the world, uh, I want to make very clear the difference between rhythm, which is the specific successions of, of, of uh, elements in time, and meter, which is this ordering of this according to strong and uh, weak beats. So let me show you the same rhythm in different metrical contexts. For example, tan, ta, ta, tan, ta, ta, tan, ta, ta, tan. Very simple rhythm, you can say with me from, from your homes or classrooms, pam, tan, 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 tan. And that in duple meter would be tan, 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 with each quarter note falling on the strong beat. But the same rhythm can be sung or performed over triple meter. And this is what happens. Tan, 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 tan. Understood? So it's very important to keep this in mind. Rhythm and meter, although very related, are different concepts. Next up, we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about melody. Melody is the succession of musical pitches. Everyone knows what a melody is. Melody is something that you can sing. Of course, different cultures arrange pitches into specific scales, also called modes. These scales usually imply already within them a certain emotional content. Let me just grab my guitar and illustrate for you guys. So the most common scales that we use in our Western culture are major and minor. Major. <laughs> associated with, with light, with happiness, no? For the most. Da, 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 di, da, da, da. This is the major scale and it's usually associated to happiness. This is the major scale. Then you have the minor scale, which is also very common in Western music. This is the minor scale and it is usually taken to be darker and sadder but not necessarily so it depends very much on the context so once again the major scale and once again the minor scale 
Then you have other kinds of scales, for example, pentatonic, which is called pentatonic, coming from the Greek five tones, that it only have five notes within the octave. The octave is one note and the same note higher up. So when you have pentatonic, you have you only have five, five notes until you get to the octave. You only have five, one, two, three, four, five. Many kinds of music, for example, blues, music's coming from uh, Africa, many sorts of Asian music, lots of uh, traditional indigenous music from the Americas also uh, are built around this context of pentatonic scales. You know? uh, we will get deeper, of course, into this as we explore each specific culture. And then we have the so-called oriental scale, uh, which has many, many, many variations and is found uh, all through the Eastern and Arab worlds sounds something like this. Can you hear the Eastern touch in this melody that I am improvising for you? This is the so-called Oriental scale, which is very particular in its sound and makes you want to get into a flying ride. So, these are scales, which are the context in which melodies happen. But not only do different cultures arrange pitch into different scales, but they also place each of the notes within the octave in a different place. And this means that there are countless different tuning systems. Often, music from cultures which are exotic to us will appear to be out of tune to our ears. But this is only because we are culturally biased. Let's have a listen now to some recordings of traditional music from around the world and enjoy its tonal and tuning diversity. We're going to listen uh, to three examples in a row. First up, a Swedish shepherd's song, then an Islamic call to prayer, and finally, a little bit of Persian classical music. Enjoy and keep your ears open and look for the different kinds of tuning. If you realize that it sounds, brackets, out of tune, that it is exactly that we are trying to listen to. Enjoy.
It is important to note that as cultural globalization deepens, many of the more subtle aspects of the different cultural musical traditions are disappearing. Such is the case with non-Western tuning systems, which are incompatible with Western instruments that are built to play on our scales and are ever more predominant around the planet. So far, we've discussed rhythm, meter, different kinds of meters that we're likely to encounter as we explore music around the world, and melody, and scales, and tuning systems. Next up is harmony, which is the result of two or more different pitches sounding together at the same time. Whereas melody and rhythm are horizontal phenomena, harmony is best understood when you think about it as a vertical concept. Think of sheet music, notes written one on top of, the, of each other meant to sound at the same time. Three or more notes sounding simultaneously are called a chord. But harmony also operates horizontally in time, creating tension and release relationships between chords that create musical movement. So release, a bit of tension, release, and more tension, which you feel like moving forward and coming back to the chord where you started. When combined with melody, harmony is very, very beautiful, interesting, rich, and deep phenomena that people spend their whole lives studying. So I'm not uh, gonna go much more deep, deeper into that right now, but we will explore different kinds of harmony as we embark on our trip. Different cultures approach harmony in diverse ways. Not all musical traditions have a harmonic dimension to their music. For example, many Eastern traditions lack chords as we know them, but rather have developed the melodic and modal dimension of music in very sophisticated ways. Often, we will find Eastern music consists of melodies played over one note, a drone, the Western musical tradition has developed a very, very rich harmonic universe, which we will explore later. Next up is timber, which is not wood falling, but it's a quality of music. Timber is often defined as the quality or the characteristic or the color of a sound. Every sound that we hear uh, is the result of a combination of countless overtones or harmonics. Let me show you. This string is providing this sound too, but at the same time is hiding inside of it all these other sounds. So the way that all of these different uh, overtones combine with each other give each sound its unique characteristics. It's what allows you to tell uh, if uh, the voice that you're hearing is uh, your friend or your mom or your dad or a recording of your own voice. Each instrument, each voice has its own unique timbre. And you can play the exact same melody on two instruments, the exact same rhythm, melody, but if the timbre is different, you will be able to tell the difference straight away. And not only that, but different cultures have different aesthetic values uh, and that is often reflected in different timbres, both vocally and in instruments. Each culture has a specific concept of what is beautiful timbre-wise. This will become very clear when we have a listen to the next examples. First up, a little bit of Italian opera sung by the great Pavarotti, then some Bulgarian village music, and finally, Hun Hur Tu, uh, straight out of Mongolia in the Asian steppe with a very particular way of producing timber with a human voice which is called throat singing. Enjoy and keep your ears open looking for the different concept of what is beautiful in terms of color, characteristic and timber in sound. Oh, oh, oh. 
So you see how beautiful and diverse timber can be in different music around the world. I really hope that you enjoyed listening to those examples. We've so far discussed rhythm, meter, melody, harmony and timber. And finally, we're going to approach the issue of articulation, which refers to the way that each note or phrase is performed. It is mostly determined by the way a sound starts and ends. Examples of articulation are legato and staccato, which are words in Italian meaning together or separate. Let me show you in this beautiful instrument, which maybe you haven't seen before. It's called the nickel harpa, and it's a traditional Swedish instrument. So legato means all together. It sounds like this. No? Everything in one bow, in this case, in a bow instrument in the voice. And on the contrary, you have staccato, which means cut apart. And it would sound like this. Or in the voice, of course, I am uh, illustrating with uh, extreme examples of articulation and there is a vast zone in between where you have to find and where each different tradition finds its way of expressing. Each culture has its own way of articulating sound and it is a very important part of the specific feel of a determined musical tradition. Also, ornamentation, that is, the use of short notes to adorn the melody is a very, very effective means of adding expressivity to music. Let me show you by playing a piece of music from Finland this time. Uh, first, with a very sober use uh, of articulation and ornamentation, and then repeat the exact same music, exaggerating the possibilities of articulation and ornamentation. I hope that you enjoy. This is called the Shotgun Orska. And now... These concepts, melody, rhythm, meter, harmony, articulation and timbre, are all going to be very useful when we embark on our journey through the music of the world. I really hope that you've enjoyed this first little excursion and I look forward to the next lesson. See you then. Llegaste desde otra tierra, dejando atrás una vida.
vida partiendo sin